Mary Valley is located in southeast Queensland and is associated with the Mary River catchment that spans a distance of approximately 170 kilometres from north to south and 100 kilometres from east to west. The Mary Valley is the home of the Cubby Cubby Nation and comprises a variety of landscapes from the Mary River floodplains and agricultural lands to rainforests and nearby mountain ranges. Due to the rich volcanic soils and subtropical climate, agriculture has traditionally dominated the local economy. Dairying was once the dominant primary industry in the catchment, but has been replaced by beef grazing. Forestry, horticulture and national parks are some of the many land uses in the catchment. But in more recent years, the proportion of residential land use has increased as commuters to neighbouring urban centres of the Sunshine Coast and tree change retirees have moved into the region enjoying the idyllic rural landscape. Residential land use is now the fourth largest land use in the catchment, as the Sunshine Coasts and Brisbane's peri-urban areas continue to expand. Um, when I think of the Mary Valley, I think of abundance. Um, at the market here today, there's an example of that with all the produce that you have to choose from and so much delicious lettuce. I think it's the be best lettuce in the world <laughs> and it's partly due to the great climate that we've got here and the soil types and the fairly good rainfall and yeah, it's a, it's a great place to live. <laughs> uh, when I think of the Mary Valley, I would think of the diversity that it has, the diversity in the creatures that live here, um, diversity in the climate and also the soil structures as well. There's different microclimates in different areas depending on what sort of soil type or whether it's into a hillside or... So that allows for a lot of stuff to be grown here as well. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of variety that you can get here and I think that's what makes it really exciting. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is community and linkages in the area. I think... Um, you have to think about the history of the area um, to, to start with, you know, that um, when, uh, of course, there are Aboriginal people here before and they found this part of the world to be very abundant and they had a lot of um, choices for food and used the river as a pathway. And, and then when white settlers came, it was for agricultural purposes originally. And, and over the years, you know, that developed through different industries and like those industries have shaped the communities that are here, like for instance the railway station we're at here was part of a railway line that used to transport produce around and like the small little communities that we have here were all um, spots where the produce was brought to and to be transported out, so things like pineapples and bananas and uh, you can just drive around you can see the evidence of um, where those things used to be grown if they, they aren't grown now and, and I think it's helped people get a sense of um, I guess the importance of hard work and and the need to work with the land to produce their living and the industries have changed like there's more beef cattle now and less small production probably than there used to be um, just because the economics are different and so that means you have different kinds of people living here and it's probably a bit harder to make a, a really good living than it, than it used to be. The impact of climate change on food production will affect Australia's communities disproportionately. Already there is a significant difference in how rural and urban households experience food security. During the 2007-2008 season, 84% of Australian agricultural businesses reported that they had experienced droughts, severe frosts, hail, severe storms, floods or an increase in seasonal variability. As a result, almost one third reported using financial reserves and or taking on increased liabilities. Climate change has emerged as a key threat to global and national food security. Greater variability in rainfall, prolonged droughts and a greater incidence of extreme weather events are expected to manifest further. Major declines in agricultural production are expected between 2050 and 2100 based on the results of climate change modelling at a global and national scale. With the weather, it's not 
average conditions that we need to worry about or you know that you think when you look at the average climate in an area it's the extreme events so the last couple of years we've had major floods which affect things like you know roads and road access and um, and uh, then you can get a hard frost at the wrong time if if you're growing down lower um, or a hailstorm we've had those which have wiped out people with tree crops and that sort of thing um, or in this country, even though it's reasonably wet, if we go for six months without any rain at all, like we did last year, um, it, the country really feels it, you know. So we missed out on the wet season completely last year. So whether these things are getting worse or more intense, it, it certainly feels that way. And it's not the big things that um, you notice, it's, um, it's little things like, when you're a small scale farmer like we are, and we do, you know, we, we're, transplanting seedlings by hand and that sort of thing so we notice it's a lot of work to put out a young seedling and um, and so if you lose that to some extreme heat conditions or or you know the wrong sort of a bright humid hot 38 degree day and your seedlings all keel over and there's nothing you can do for it you sort of notice that and I, I'd say we get that experience more now than what I can remember but you know I also haven't been alive <laughs> long enough to know the real trend but certainly does feel like there's more of these events. Yeah. What people probably don't understand when we're talking about the effect of climate on growing crops and plants is just how subtle some of the the connections are like um, a lot of our crops are need the right day length and the right temperatures and the right humidities all, all working at the right time and then the right insects around for pollination. Everything all fits together fairly closely and if we get, it can only be what seems to be a small change to one of those attributes and then the whole system doesn't fit together. You know, you don't have bees around at the time when you need them to pollinate or the things are going crazy with the way they're flowering or setting seed because there's some mismatch between temperature and day length and I don't think people understand just how agriculturally how those things are linked and, and um, how much of an effect it can have on a crop if the things don't happen in the way that the, that crop is used to them happening. Uh, we've been growing feijoas here at Belli Park since 2007. So we started um, planting then in groups of 50s as we could get tree stock. In that time we probably encountered every sort of good and bad weather condition that you could have, including um, very wet years at the start. So that, that changed the way that we planted our trees because it was just um, constant rain from really Christmas through till mid of, middle of the year. So very, very wet summers. Um, and then in the last few years it's changed to being a very dry summer with all our wet weather in one big event and the big events uh, so it's sort of gone flood and drought in one year and that's happened since around 2011 I'd say so um, from Cyclone Oswald which did really affect us um, luckily we're on the edge of it but still lost some nets and lost some trees and all of that sort of thing with those swelling winds and um, really heavy rain since 2011 I think we're seeing a pattern where we're getting all our weather in one big event so all our wet weather in one big event so this year 2014 it all came around the end of March which is mid-season for us so it's all about for us collecting rain when we came to the property we had one really good dam and it was something we liked about the property but we quickly realised we'd like to put in a second one um, which we've used so we're glad about that and we're actually looking at a third now so water storage is sort of the key to farming at the moment, <laughs> and probably always. Extreme weather events are manageable if you are getting enough return from, from the, um, the work that you're doing to be able to pay for the damage and to have some reserves. Like, you know, if it costs you a fair bit to, to repair something, you just need to have the profit there in other years to be able to do that. And that is what the problem is at the moment. There's no profits in agriculture across the board, definitely in, in dairy. Um, and that it stops us from being able to manage those, those extreme weather events and pay for the damage that's done. Yeah, I, I think the extreme weather events are a part of the farming cycle. 
and farmers know this and, and live with it and have grown up with it and even build their business structures around trying to uh, prevent the, the problems associated with the extreme weather, uh, whether it be drought or flood. But uh, when there's not enough money in the system to invest in the infrastructure you need uh, to keep a constant feed supply, uh, that's where the troubles begin and that's what we've seen here. If we could invest in storing feed in silage or hay, uh, we'd be able to ride out a lot of these events a lot better. But while we're, while we're supplying this sort of a market for the milk, there's just not enough money in it to do so. The, the impacts of drought and flood are not just how much feed you can grow on your own property or how your own animals are doing. Uh, with the dairying, there's so much feed that you have to buy in. Um, grain, hay, silage, and obviously all these other farmers are very badly affected by the, the flood and the drought situation as well. So uh, w when you have that situation, the grain price can even double um, in a very short period of time and, and that puts our, our farm under a lot of pressure economically. So, and yeah. then it's made even worse by the fact that sometimes you can't even irrigate when, when, when you desperately need to to get the feed for the cows because there's just not enough water in the, in the, in the whole river. That's right. That it can it, be a problem too. Yeah, you can have the two adverse extremes, but I, I'd certainly, the feed, the, the cost of buying in feed is a major impact yes. in a flood or a drought. Yeah, no, the landscape's certainly changed, yeah. Obviously, in the 40 years that I've been here, the, yes, there's a, a huge difference. Like, it, yeah, it used to be all, like when we were going to school, it was all, all the kids in our class were farmers, and, and uh, now there's, yeah, we're the odd ones out for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like, uh, even in the last 14 years, uh, we've dropped from oh, over 30, 30 farms up here on the range to uh, less than 10 now, so, yeah. It's, it's certainly a dying breed. Yeah, while we started our own uh, processing factory uh, for bottling milk was, uh, yeah, obviously the year 2000 deregulation uh, was was coming. It was written on the wall that we weren't going to get the money for our raw milk and so the only other way was to diversify. Yeah, us kids got together and built a built our own uh, factory and, and started uh, putting milk into bottles. With uh, the tour side of things, definitely, yeah, it, it's definitely a, a, a positive. They, we welcome welcome them to come to the farm and have a look, and, and that's what it's about. Uh, uh, it's not everywhere you can go and look at a processing plant and and see see what how it's how milk gets put in the bottles. So yeah, it's no, they're definitely an asset, uh, and the return is on them buying milk for the future and. And uh, yeah, it's it's sort of a long-term investment having them come visit us. The middle-sized farmers being squeezed out. Uh, there's lots of reasons for it. So you need to focus on either being a small, sustainable farm, and that also focuses on organic farming and everything that's good about. Um, being able to work yourself with the land. And then there's the place for the great big corporations who um, have the volume to feed the supermarket type chains. So I see that distinct two groups um, evolving, which is not fitting where the middle farmer was because they just, um, the equipment needed to be at that scale, the debt that they needing, the cost of land, all those things just don't add up to making that business model work. So that's how we set up our farm. It's um, small enough that it can be run with people. Uh, so the machinery costs are very low. It's run on um, one hectare of land. So we've still got spare land. We could diversify further, which is easy to do. So our whole farm is self-supporting on 11 acres, which is quite a little bit of land. But in other countries, that's a big bit of land. <laughs> and it's a more satisfying way of, of farming as well. So, and, um, much more involved with the community. When it comes to pricing of produce and, and how, how the price and markets are at, I don't think I'd, we'd grown anything for a supermarket since about 1996 because we just can't be at the scale to compete at that level, so we don't try now. So the beauty of where, the way we're doing things, the local community stuff, our pricing is actually negotiated directly with our customers and it works, so works where, where um, we're not knocked about by the pricing as much as what we were if we were just selling a commodity for cash. 
we're trying to work a direct relationship with customers and selling directly and so they get to know us a bit and we've had people come up and actually see the farm and um, spend a bit of time and they want to come up and help do stuff sometimes so we, it's a, a process of we get at this sort of relationship a, a bit better and people learn more about what's going on and, and that seems to be working all right. We're still very small scale but it's a, quite a pleasant way of doing <laughs> doing things compared to um, selling into a market that possibly doesn't understand you know what you or doesn't care what you're trying to do yeah. I think the dairy market is is a corrupted market or it's not a fully functioning market it, it, it's not operating on supply and demand principles uh, there's clearly a shortage of milk in Queensland uh, a very large demand for the milk uh, the most sought out product by consumers, uh, most sought out product by the supermarkets to use in their promotions for them to make money, um, yet the farmers can't get a reasonable return. Uh, so to me that, that shows there's a clear problem in the market and it, and it all comes back to the market power from two, uh, two, two players having 80% of the sales. No one can say no to them. Yep. No, one, no other country has that sort of monopoly in the retail market and milk's just used as a loss leader to get people in the door and sell the other products. Just 50 years ago, not many kids in, in, in the cities had, didn't have a, a, a very direct link to farmers. Their father was a farmer, their uncle was there, they go there for holidays, you know, they regularly get their meat there, they, you know, whatever it is, they had a very close link. Nowadays, that link is further and further away. You find that their, very, their parents don't even have a link anymore. Um, so, so to actually know where food comes from, well, for most city kids, it comes out of the supermarket now, and it comes out five days a week. Well, Maple Street Cooperative has been here for 34 years, and the ethics behind it is clean, sustainable food and the best price we can possibly give our members and our growers. We have a lot of growers that supply us regularly um, with everything from potatoes to citrus. Our charter is to support them, um, cut out the middle person and give them the best possible price that we possibly can for our members and for the, for the farmers. We try to source local food first, spray free organic food and then if we can't get the food that way we will look a further afield but it always has to be organic. It's very important for us to teach our members um, about seasonal food and growing, particularly in the co-op and in the restaurant, that if you're getting food that's not in season, chances are it's coming from a lot of food miles, a lot of kilometres. I don't think resilience is possible if we're not connected with seasons. We need to know what can grow now on our doorstep within our horizon and we can eliminate the middleman, we can eliminate the miles and we can feed ourselves in case of emergencies. Mm -hmm. There are lots of substitutes we can use um, that are useful um, survival foods that last through drought and through rain and which have multiple uses, fruit for longer periods and yield good results in terms of nutrition as well. Lots of tubers grow in southeast Queensland in subtropical climates like cassava, taro, arrowroot. Um, there's also alternatives to fruits like acerola cherries and native raspberries. And they all grow for me without any trouble, no tending, no water. And the thing is that all these plants, if you can think about ways of preserving them or dehydrating them or fermenting them, will all help you in times of emergency. Food security is essentially having readily accessible food at all times, which is nutritionally adequate for a healthy and active life and is affordable, safe and culturally acceptable. Factors like food supply and food access directly determine food security. In Australia, food security is an issue. 7% of the general population in South Australia and more than 5% of people in New South Wales have experienced food insecurity at some point within a specified 12-month period. Predictors of household food insecurity have been identified as access to the shops, price of food, and having adequate time to shop, prepare and cook food. 
Households with children were also identified as being twice as likely to be food insecure than households without children. And the elderly person living alone was also identified as being at risk of food insecurity. Agricultural resilience is used quite frequently in the media and there's quite a few different definitions and different applications of the term. Um, in general it actually means how our food system can actually cope and respond to disruptions. In Australia we have both long supply chains and short supply chains. Um, we are very reliant on our long supply chains and in fact um, we have a, two um, large supermarkets that operate in Australia that have a market share of about 70 to 80 percent of retail sales. Um, in terms of fresh food, they actually have a market share of about 50 percent. So trying to transport fresh food around the country, we're very reliant upon trucks and freight systems. And that is problematic. We really don't hold a lot of food in Australia, which makes us quite vulnerable. So should all of a sudden those transport, um, transport networks get disrupted, then all of a sudden a lot of Australia is very vulnerable. So in recent memory, that's happened in around 2010, 2011. Um, the whole of Queensland was declared a disaster zone. We had a massive flood that knocked out major markets. And all of the distribution centres, the central distribution centres are located within three or four kilometres of each other. So they all got flooded and all that produce got knocked out as well. The actual impact on the community was huge. So we had um, communities in more regional locations that couldn't actually access food for five or six days. And that's a problem if you don't live in a growing region, of course. So, and there was a lot of hysteria, a lot of panic, and I think there was recognition by our federal government that our current food supply system is very vulnerable. Already we're working with a freight system that is really struggling to actually transport that food around the country. So um, that problem is going to become increasingly worse. We're also seeing massive inequality in food prices between regional and remote areas as well. And that's also going to increase because the food prices are very much coupled with energy and fuel prices. So. Um, so we probably do need to rethink how we actually provide food in regional and remote areas. One of the things that we know is that long food chains, the supermarket type food chains, are vulnerable. And local economies, Mary Valley type economies, have got the opportunity of developing short chain food chains. And that means regional, seasonal, local produce that local people will, will uh, enjoy, but also people will come in from abroad, from, from outside the region, simply to sample that, that produce. Now, that's in keeping with sort of ecotourism, it's in keeping with small scale and local production, smaller scale farming. Maybe we'll see in the future large scale production that's harnessing um, new technologies all for export. But the growth, as we've seen in the United States to some extent, and Europe, of these local producers being able to find niche markets. Um, and I know that that's being done with products like honey, cheese, wine, and, and you know the rest. Um, is that going to be the future for a viable rural community? Um, I don't know that we know that at this stage. Agricultural businesses are extremely vulnerable to economic and environmental shocks like extreme weather events. Agriculture commodity statistics compiled by the Australian government identify that in the last 40 years, the number of Australian farms has decreased by 30%. In the last 30 years, the number of farmers has also decreased by 40%, most noticeably in the younger age groups, as young farmers turn away from the labour intensity, uncertainty and struggle associated with modern farming. The number of dairy farmers in Queensland has almost halved since 1999-2000 when the industry became deregulated. The demise in dairy farming defies global trends in which every other dairy region in the world has increased production to meet increased demand. In the period between 2006 and 2013, New Zealand and India have both increased milk production by 135% and Brazil by 124%. During this same period, milk production in Australia decreased by about 6%. Once was a time in Australian uh, economic history where it was appropriate for governments to intervene to support agriculture. Um, certainly in the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s that was uh, a, a basic uh, tenet 
that we would end up with a situation where tax relief, subsidies, um, uh, quotas, various things like that for imports, all of those work to support the family farm. But it was around about the 1970s and then certainly in the neoliberal era of the last 30 years where uh, those benefits have been taken away from producers. Um, some producers have done very well out of that because they've been able to lock into free markets and uh, sell their products openly and, and for a lot of money. But a lot of the family farmers struggled and those in regional areas, um, Mary Valley, um, regional Victoria, regional New South Wales, they've often been smaller scale and therefore when those benefits have been taken away they've, they've struggled and we've seen the um, reduction in the number of producers, we've seen uh, producers with very limited economic resources to put into their properties from year to year, then they get struck with droughts and floods and so on. So it's not been a very, it's been a precarious existence for many, many family farmers in Australia. One of the things about the Mary Valley is the landscape, is the, the mix of agriculture, rural grazing, and other factors that give this very pleasant landscape. If you change agriculture, if you change farming practices, that will go. And not only will the local community not identify with that anymore, neither will visitors. And that has implications for the whole economy uh, of that society. When people live in an area, they develop a sense of ownership, a sense of place, where they work together to maintain that cultural structure. I think this community in particular still has very strong links to the dairy industry and farming in general, even though the industry is struggling, there's a very strong cultural link and it's, it's very important for the identity of this community. One of the things that we've noticed in terms of um, policy internationally is that not all countries have gone along Australian lines and said we want to have free markets as part of a neoliberal regime, free trade world um, regime. What countries like Norway, um, Japan, Iceland, uh, there, there are a number, have said, well, we actually like our farmers and we want to give them the protection that we believe they need to keep heritage values. And therefore, farmers in those areas that have been farming for thousands and thousands of years um, are seen as part of a cultural landscape, a part of a heritage landscape. And therefore, not only governments, but the people who vote in those governments are saying, we are prepared to spend more on food to help subsidise those producers to stay uh, as part of our cultural heritage. We don't do that in Australia. We don't do it in New Zealand anymore. Um, but that is a political philosophy. And, and part of that as well is that you can see the food benefits because instead of just reliant, like Norway would be, importing all its food, it says, well, we've got a food security issue here. We want our producers to produce at least half our food. OK, we'll import, but we'll subsidise them to produce at least half our food. That way there's sort of food security built into that policy and there's also um, what you call multifunctional value. Multifunctionalism, the idea that the landscape is more than just a productive um, enterprise. It's got to do with cultural uh, heritage, tourism, uh, uh, landscape amenity, the, the, the beauty of the landscape. Uh, so if you value those things, you build them into your agricultural policy. If you don't value those things, as I don't believe we do in Australia, or if we do, we're not doing much about it, because we're just wanting to get the producers to be as efficient as they possibly can be uh, in the international marketplace. I see a landscape as being a heritage resource. It's something that people identify with and they want to be a part of. If you change that, that all changes. Yes, it'll be different and different people will see it differently. But the issue is, is those people that are living there, will they gain the benefit that they have in the past? And will the new people respect the heritage that's been given to them? In many cases, that is lost. The Mary Valley provides a unique case study of historically productive land, blessed with good soil and abundant rainfall and sunshine which have supported a thriving agricultural-based economy for many years. However, like many other regions in Australia, particularly those close to expanding cities, the Mary Valley is under enormous pressure to transition to a commuter's or retiree's lifestyle region, foregoing its agricultural legacy and associated cultural heritage. 
Many Australian farmers do have coping and adaptation strategies in place to deal with ongoing climate variability, but often lack the required resources that would enable them to rebuild and adequately prepare. In the past, the central market was designed to absorb some of the costs of these necessary protective measures. However, in more recent times, due to the market dominance of two supermarkets in Australia, farmers are experiencing diminishing returns for their produce. As a result, from 1975, the number of Australian farms has decreased by a third. Since the 1980s, the number of farmers has also decreased by more than 100,000, which is about 40%, and this trend is set to continue. Research compiled by KPMG last year stated that the profitability of Australian food and grocery manufacturers is now significantly lower than international comparators. In contrast, Australian-based supermarkets are posting profits far in excess of other international supermarkets. Of this Mary Valley case study, the fragility of Australia's food security and agricultural resilience is highlighted. Climate change and extreme weather events are but one of the pressures on modern day farming, one which many farmers say they are able to contend with if they are supported by governmental policy enabling them to take back some of the profits from the supermarket giants. Mm -hmm.